Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Welcome to Science Faction 19, the science faction of heat. We are here in San Diego as it is literally on fire all around us and about 103 degrees. But we got to bring the science. We can't stop bringing the science. Yeah. It's the only way to defeat Armageddon, which is upon us. Right. I am your host, Robert Timothy, full-time archaeologist, part-time stand-up comedian. With me, as always, is my biomedical research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm really excited to be spending the apocalypse with you, too. Yeah, the, sh- the heatopolis. <laughs> um, and Damien, the self-proclaimed sweatiest comedian in San Diego, how are you dealing with this heat? It's terrible. I had to ring up my underwear before the show. Yeah. You could have done that in a different room, by the way. It would have been nice. It was incredibly inefficient for you to ring out your old underwear onto your newer pair of underwear. <laughs> Listen, I've forgotten it's where really I placed them. really just a them. snake eating its own tail at that point. <laughs> and I would like to send a shout-out to some of our new listeners. We've had a huge surge in South Africa. So thanks to all our South African listeners who are leading the charge. And uh, we love you guys, and we hope you're followed uh, closely by all the other countries that seem to be jumping on board your your close second is great britain so uh get a couple more subscribers great britain and you'll conquer south africa this Finally. time this time for good <laughs> thank you bruce uh also getting big in the eu and then the small but mighty new zealand even though they have a population that's about the same as the city we currently live in they're they're making up about five percent of our new increases somehow we're way more popular in other countries than we are in america so uh that probably i'm gonna guess that's because science isn't as popular in america like we're just not as good at it so only other countries are getting interested because only smart countries and smart people like this is ever all the stereotypes you've heard about america are true we're in this wasteland <laughs> That's right. So thank you uh, to everybody out there, especially you South Africans who seem to be taken off with it. And also, we want to just apologize real bl- briefly for any time we lose you guys when we're talking about American football or American politics or American hatred of women. You guys might not be as familiar <laughs> with it as we have here, so uh, yes, sorry. Please please write to us and let us know about your international hatred of women. That's, we're happy yeah. to discuss that as well. That's right. What's your take on, on feminism and, you know, how laughable it is? <laughs> yeah, just... Go ahead. So everybody keep listening. Thank you. And keep subscribing. Get your friends to subscribe, please. We want this to keep going and keep being as successful as it has been. Uh, and maybe you guys could be the next South Africa. Uh, I'm looking at you, Denmark. Oh, That's right. I got a... Uh, out. And I want to read a letter here from one of our South African listeners. Quick uh, note that was emailed to us via our Podbean account. Greetings. I've been a listener now for about two months, and I love the show, but I'm trying to figure out who exactly is your target audience. You guys seem too dirty for scientists and too sciencey for people who like dirty comedy. Who are you trying to reach with your show? Keep up the good work. Joe from Pretoria. Well, Joe, we're trying to reach you. We're trying to reach uh, anybody who's got an interest in science and who might be wooed by our comedic stylings. You're right. Generally, scientists don't tend to go for very dirty humor, and generally people who go for very dirty humor aren't incredibly interested in science, but hopefully if we do our jobs right, they will be. If we're dirty enough, we can uh, lure some fans away from Larry the Cable Guy. That's right. <laughs> we're a gateway drug yeah. for science. And if we're sciencey enough, I'm hoping some of my friends at work will actually be able to laugh. That's right. And with that, let's move right into science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, a couple of good articles this week, some very interesting stuff going on. One that I wanted to put up because it involved science education in general, uh, this was looking at STEM classes particularly, but probably applies to most forms of undergraduate lectures. They have found that traditional lectures are one of the most ineffective means of communicating information. Finally. Well, yeah. I never went to class. I <laughs> thought it was an, an inefficient waste of my time. Sleeping yeah. or smoking pot was way more efficient. Yeah, you, yeah. Were, you were worried about wasting time, and so you stayed the fuck out of class. That's right, exactly. to smoke pot. Yeah, and then I just copied off an Asian kid during the test. Yeah. That's, that's how my grandfather graduated college. And His and forefathers take... before him. Analysis of undergraduate classes that used the standard lecture model versus active participation method showed that active participation leads to lowered failure rates, boosted scores on exams, and that the difference is by almost one half of a standard deviation, so a statistically significant difference, sometimes 6% increase in exam scores. And some of the methods that they use for active participation could be as simple as 
asking students random questions throughout the lecture to make sure that everybody's interested and everybody's following along, using handheld clickers for students to count a certain number of things going on in a lecture, calling in on individual groups or people randomly, and having students clarify concepts to each other and reach consensus on an issue. One of my favorite tactics that I got introduced when I was looking at science education on a broader scale was flipping the, the classroom, uh, which is where you find an old classroom and then you fix it up and then you sell it to white people who are trying to gentrify an area. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, we should get a show about that. That's where, right. Yeah, where we you should call Bravo. Flipping education. No, uh, that would be house flipping. But uh, flipping the classroom is where you actually, as a teacher or professor, you record your lectures. The students go home and they watch the lecture at home online. And then when they come in, instead of doing a lecturing classroom, they do what they would normally call your homework. And the reason they do this is because digital technology is so accessible, almost anybody can look up a lecture and watch it at home as their homework. Mm -hmm. Then they come in, and when they need the teacher the most, when they're doing the work, that's when they have them available to them. I'm completely against this. I mean, it sounds like it'd be very good for the country, but for me, like... I loved working shtick in a class. And yeah, it kind of disrupted the lesson and everything. Like if everybody's doing the actual learning at home, how am I You're talking to about as a, as a student, you liked interrupting with jokes and needless ob observations to kind of annoy the teacher. Yeah, but to be fair, they were entertaining. If, I mean, sometimes to yeah. other students, but mostly to me. Yeah, you okay. were entertaining yourself. Think of how much more fun this would make your erotica writing class. Well, I mean, if the teacher were willing to make a very specific, like if I'm picturing myself as 18-year-old Damien in a flipped classroom that's been sold to a gentrified white couple. Yes. <laughs> uh, if I'm there and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a hot teacher or maybe, a, you know, maybe a not a hot teacher. Maybe he teaches me to start settling or she teaches me to start settling <laughs> at a young age. Don't get my expectations too high. I like Learn to find this attractive now and the transition <laughs> will not be as bad later on. It's a life lesson, really. Yeah, the uh, the flipping thing makes a lot of sense because it helps students who otherwise have problems. You know, I, I don't understand this material. Well, that's fine. You got the the expert there right next to you. It's your teacher, your professor. It also keeps people from falling behind because it's not I didn't do the homework. You do the homework in class. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to be walking around checking that you did it. You're accountable for it. Mm -hmm. So they've had a lot of good success with th different tactics like this. But it turns out that just being somebody standing up in front of a classroom and preaching what you're trying to teach doesn't work so well especially when you consider a lot of these people at the college level are experts in their field. You're talking mm -hmm. about people who know a whole bunch on their field. And what does that mean? It means they spend a lot of time studying that field, not necessarily a lot of time learning how to teach that field. Yeah. And so a lot of times the problems become, especially at prestigious universities, you have professors who are more than capable of teaching graduate classes, but ironically enough, pretty bad at teaching undergrad classes. But I think this is, this is something that, you know, if you were to sit down and think about it, you wouldn't be shocked by these results, because even even down to the elementary school level. I mean, how much more fun did you have learning and how much more did you remember when you had an activity or something interactive versus just listening to something? I mean, that's true. I think that's true of everybody. Yeah. Yeah, be it in high school or college, remember your best teachers. Your best teachers were always the ones that engaged, were kind of fun. Maybe right. they weren't fun, but at least they engaged with you. They made you think or something. And those ones that you liked, you know, you could turn a blind eye if they touched a student. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they said you were pretty first, yeah. you know, it's like, well, I mean, that was nice. Also, if they were the ones that gave you like five minutes early out, you know, you had you had oh, totally. the last period of the day and they let you out five minutes early, you get yeah, out of the parking leave lot. Early. Yeah. Get in my car. Yeah. I'll be I'm, there soon. It's the unlikable teachers that can't get away with kissing students. That's no, right. No, that's exactly right. Well, then let me ask you, my panelist, a couple of questions. Eric Mauser, a physicist from Harvard University who's been uh, preaching against traditional lecture styles for quite a while. <laughs> How does he preach against – does he, like, encourage people to interact with each other and That's then right. surprise? Yeah. He Stop said, learning. He sends a video with the email that everybody's expected to watch <laughs> when they get there. And okay. then he asks them questions specifically about the video. As long as he doesn't stand up and tell them. So he makes a statement. I wonder how true you guys think it is. Is it now unethical – to, to simply do a lecture in a normal fashion. Unethical? We, yeah, because are you saying if, if your learning rates and your retention rates and your failure rates are so much worse than other styles of teaching, you choosing purposely to take an ineffective method of teaching, does that become unethical? I, I think it's a bit bold to say ineffective. Just because one way is a little bit better doesn't less mean... Less effective. Yeah, less effective, sure. Which is, you know, once it's their classroom, it's their prerogative, I guess. Is it their argument that teaching yourself to be disciplined enough to sit through this and not be distracted and yeah. you know is the key to success is that their mentality perhaps i you mean the people who continue to teach in a traditional i think that change just comes slowly and you have people who have taught that way forever and you know mm -hmm. I, 
heck, Oxford has been using the same routine since the first half of this millennium yeah. to teach. So I, I, it's yeah, things come around to shit about Oxford. That's like the University of Phoenix. Like of when do you ever hear about Oxford? Yeah, nobody's ever even. But heard. also, like you know, in the academic setting, there are plenty of professors who teaching isn't their first priority. Yes. you know, their laboratory work or their research is their first priority, and teaching is something they have to do to make sure they can continue to stay there and do that research. Can't they just outsource it to their most charismatic TA, or maybe uh, hire a stand-up comic to learn the the syllabus? That would almost be better. I think. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually think when it comes to a lot of undergrad education, you would do better with people who were trained in how to teach and how to interact with students than you would experts in that field. Because undergrad is not, you don't go into enough depth that you'd really lose out just having somebody who was really familiar as opposed to the world's expert, you know, in that topic. But so much of that, you know, when I picture in college, I can, I can think of five professors who were outstanding and I can think of five who were terrible, but also outside of the classroom, the outstanding ones were great and the terrible ones were terrible to hang out with. You know, yeah. th their personalities were not conducive to this learning environment. Get better personality people. Have yeah. them work underneath a professor that can, like, answer all the hard questions yeah. and tell them about the lecture and then have them perform the lecture. It's like yeah. uh, Gallagher when he sold his act to Gallagher, his brother, and he became Gallagher too and he toured around <laughs> doing Al Gallagher's act. <laughs> I Damien, about that. Damien could buy... <laughs> you know, Lawrence Krauss's physics lecture act and just go around yeah, a different up? universe. <laughs> oh, that's black Lawrence Krauss's physics lecture. Sorry, I just heard a voice from nowhere. What? That's right. <laughs> okay, guys, let me ask you this. What innovative teaching strategy have they not yet tried, but they should? You know what they have tried, but they should get back to, because I don't think it was explored, was uh, the type of teaching and educating that you saw in 80s movies, where all the principals walked around with baseball bats. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah. Were, were tough. Like, like if, if your principal walked around with a baseball bat, you'd, totally. you'd study harder. You'd there totally. was there was two tactics they'd actually use. They'd have the principal with the baseball bat and also a learning montage in which you and a bunch of other <laughs> misfits were were combing through books in the middle of a library with mm -hmm. some hair metal playing in the background, and by the end, you passed the test. Yeah. I think uh, I think we're missing out on that niche of hallucinogenic learning. Oh, you know where you sort of transcend, you know, all all of life here, and you really open up your mind. That's think, true. You know, you know, I I'm sure it's bad for kids with a developing brain, but I must say, if anybody could be benefit from a little bit of a hallucinogen experience, your average 15 year old male could probably. <laughs> Aren't we all developing? That's right. Yeah, it's part of the journey. Like, there are, ter there are horrible parts about being a teenage male that make you what you are. Be you're the very first time you talk to a girl, very first time you interrupt a teacher, very first time a teacher kisses you after class. Were these all the same time, Damien? The, no, the, two separate times because the teacher was not a girl. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, because libraries are going to become obsolete because we're, everything is going to be digital. There's right. going to be no reason to have a big room for all these books. So every city and mu municipality is going to have these rooms, these big buildings that are not going to have a use anymore. So how do we use those for educational purposes? That's when I got the idea. You know who else we keep failing? Pretty girls. Now, oh. again, I know for some of our foreign listeners, they might not get this as much. In America, hot girls tend to not do so well in school. Uh -huh. Right, so you get these hot girls who are doing really poorly Why in school. Why would they have to? They, they're, they're attractive. That seems to be right. the mentality. So, and this isn't. Of course, there's some pretty girls who do well and stuff. They're usually Canadian, but every once in a while, <laughs> uh, so we get these these very attractive girls. Uh, they don't do super well in school, you know, and then they graduate high school. And what do they do? They were the hottest girl in their high school, and they move on to good Getting job, up. yeah, or bagging groceries or something else. Let's give them an opportunity and let's increase our science and math education. Here's how you do it. You take the hottest chick who was a senior last year, you know, mm -hmm. class of 2013 that just graduated. Over summer, what's she going to do? She realizes she doesn't have a job or anything. She's going to get laid. They come, That's true. They, <laughs> they be stripping. The school yeah. administration comes to her with a proposal. How would you like a job? Pays really well. Starts at 45 k a year. Health benefits, a whole nine yards. And she's like, oh, my God, this is infinitely better than I'd ever get anywhere else on the open market. What do I do? And they're like, you're the chick who gives hand jobs to every freshman, sophomore, and junior who gets an, a 4.0 or higher. And so she goes to the wow. library. And in the library is a bunch of stalls segregated out like cubicles, and they're the hot chicks from surrounding schools and stuff. And if you come in with your report card showing that you got it, the hottest chick in your school last year gives you an HJ. We would this dominate would China and India. They would, they would be our mental bitches if we pulled this off. Absolutely. Listen, if we want more women 
to graduate and then go into hard sciences, but they're just not. So yeah. think maybe about, this would flood Think of all the people this sciences. helps. Not only could our young men be scrambling to get A pluses in every science and math class they could, uh, they could, not only would that happen, but all of a sudden these women who otherwise have short-sighted careers that go nowhere would be getting paid pretty well to at least establish I, themselves. I'm sorry. How is this not some form of prostitution? I, I'm not sure how you would call it prostitution. Well, it's you're being pa you're paying you're being paid for a sex act. No, she what? is being paid to give hand jobs. A sex act. She is getting her hand job subsidized <laughs> well, okay. by a municipality. Okay. Completely different. Yeah. Well, not her hand job. It was the rumor in Iraq that Dutch <laughs> that the Dutch government. We need uh, a segment of Iraq rumors, by the way. <laughs> Dutch uh, would hire prostitutes for their soldiers, like who are overseas, because they uh -huh. felt it helped keep morale up. Like, that's a government that cares. They support the troops. <laughs> yeah, Technically, the Japanese government that. did the same thing, only they didn't really hire them so much as stole a bunch of Chinese women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She doesn't have to do it. She can go and live the normal life she wanted to before. She could go be the bad grocery girl. But should she choose to contribute to the society around her and help those young men come out to be the leaders of science and math of the future, she has that opportunity. What about what about the girls? Why why don't girls have some incentive? What should we? I would love to. What, yeah, what please, do we what give to the women to to incentivize them? It's not as money? easy. The thing is, the guys are really <laughs> easy. Yeah, you could do money, but the thing is, that's not going to work with women who are who, girls who come from wealthy families. What about there? girls who want to get plastic surgery to look like the girls who are giving the hand jobs? Okay, I could do plastic surgery one. Easy. What was your favorite band in high school? You get tickets to whatever boy band, in sync, whatever. whatever. Backstreet Boys, who I'm seeing next week. Okay, so like <laughs> One Direction tickets to yeah. all the girls. Bieber comes by and hangs out Gross. with every girl who was in the top whatever percentage of her class. All right. I could see where that would apply. I still think it's disgusting disgusting listen we're working i mean the bieber part well, i'm just gonna say this because i know this discussion could go on forever but for any mayors or school educators or anybody out there looking for innovative programs to really stir the pot up and boost your test scores stir the pot up is an understatement <laughs> question number three as learning becomes more and more digital what will schools look like in 100 years apparently like brothels <laughs> those are the libraries jackie <laughs> those are the libraries well, in San Diego, they will look like ashes and timber because this whole city is burning down <laughs> as we speak. Yeah. There's like six fires going on it within 30 miles of us at different points. Yeah. And that's why we do a podcast, so that nobody will suspect that we were the arsonists. That's right. Jackie, what do you think schools will look like? I, I'm afraid they'll look very sterile. I, I like the library. I like all of the, the little homey aspects of school, but I'm, I'm afraid they'll look very sterile and, you know, no books. That that sort of scares me a bit. No books. I almost feel like you're going to walk into your little learning pod and you're going to yeah. go in there and you're going to get your information that way. And then maybe you will, and you'll do that like in your house. And then maybe you'll convene with other kids for oh, a weird God, but social Oh, the homeschool era. kids are so weird. I know. It's going to be the sad part. But would you? Would the kid get to decorate it, or would the parent? Like, for example, uh, you know, when it's in kindergarten, the learning pods decorated in like bright colors and like pictures of trains and everything, drawings yeah. of lions and everything. But it's just stapled with porn by the time he's seventeen, or <laughs> One Direction if it's a she. Wait, so the pod is only for the kid, so the parents can't go in the pod. No, and take it's just a one-person pod. He's just sitting in there, or she's sitting in there, and they get they have a view screen where they can see their instructor, and they have workspaces and stuff. You need no. you need to make it access DNA. You could, that way, you, otherwise, you could hire an Asian kid to come in and cheat for you in the learning pod. <laughs> no, no. But the point is, I thought this whole this all started because we wanted more interactive learning. If we're all in a pod, that takes that out. No, of it. because there's a lot of programmable interactive learning, and then eventually the pod is like the cars from Minority Report, where like it'll zoom along the road too and go to the the central meeting point with a bunch of other pods, so everybody can get out and kick a kickball around for a little bit. Yeah, you yeah you'd have to uh, you'd have to organize something social. Yeah. Otherwise, so we'll still have PE. <laughs> that's right. You'll still have something like that. Maybe, maybe by that point, PE in schools will just be gangbangs. I don't. I don't know if I like the future you guys are coming up with. Are you kidding? That would prepare. I was. I don't so know if it's awkward. a great place for women. Is what I'm saying. I was what? so well, wait, yeah, wait. Women hate gangbangs. That's wait. so fucking. Yeah, sexy. and they hate <laughs> a, an America that improves its science and math learning. They must yeah. They must just hate that, right, yeah. Damien? Yeah. That's. I, I would hate America to be a industrial and scientific powerhouse mm -hmm. too i mean that, that would offend me as well science learning really pisses me I off i don't think that you're looking at this from all perspectives does al-qaeda know you're a woman when they let you in like did they know <laughs> never heard anybody who hates america as much as jackie we'll move on to the you. next story how before, dare you yeah before we rightfully get shut down by for violations of the patriot act um <laughs> 
Another article about polar bears. Apparently, polar bears split from grizzlies. Man, we love polar bears. We really do. Show. Apparently, they split from was grizzlies. Your rap name, Polar Bee, in but high school. It was my rap name. <laughs> I was a white bear in a brown bear world. It's cold as ice. Apparently, they split from grizzly bears more recently than they previously thought. I had always heard somewhere around a million to five million years ago. It looks now like it's three hundred to half a million, three hundred thousand to half a million years ago. So not very long at all. And what's really interesting is the genes that that really drove this were metabolism genes because when the grizzlies got isolated and, and separated off into polar bears, they switched to a diet of almost exclusively meat and fat, which would kill a grizzly bear. Grizzly mm-hmm. bears need berries and everything else. They can't just have meat and fat. So Grizzly bears are such pussies. <laughs> yeah. I, I beat up carbs. grizzly bears regularly. If I don't have sugar by halfway through the day, I just get crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> most... Most importantly were the genes for metabolism that, that drove this. And for polar bears, profound obesity, including 50% of their body weight being fat, is a completely benign state. It's not unhealthy. Like, could you <sighs> imagine 50% fat? God, such gluttony. And it's just benign. And one of the theories is if we could figure out what these genes are, because they do coordinate with human genes, if we could figure out what these genes are that keep them from getting high cholesterol levels, that keep them from getting heart disease, that allow them to live off fat and meat with high glucose and everything else and not have really bad effects, if we could figure that out, we might be able to replicate it in human beings. You're right. We should stop natural selection. Yeah. We should just let people live however they yeah. want. Or more than that, we should stop looking for ways to be, quote unquote, healthier and just just make it okay to yeah. be more. We just rich. need a pill. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle Obama coming out and saying that kids should exercise <laughs> offended Bobby so much that he funded this research. Um, oh, by the way, they also mentioned the, the hybrids that were going on between grizzlies and polar bears because they're now with global warming, the grizzly bears are essentially going up further north and the polar bears are staying off the ice flows longer because they can't make it back onto an ice flow. So they're in the same territory and they're mating, creating what are very interestingly called pizzlies. Pizzlies? <laughs> Pizzly is a mixture of a polar bear and a grizzly bear. So on to a couple of questions. These bears evolved very quickly to deal with otherwise unhealthy high-fat diets. Will humans have to do the same? Will Chicago Bears fans become the cholesterol-resistant polar bears of NFL fans? I think I think we're learning that we cannot adapt to this sort of lifestyle, that instead we're going to get horrible diseases and die very young. The survivors of this, you know, those who who survived the Chicago slow rolling natural disaster that is high cholesterol, (laughs) those who survive will be that much like, for example, a polar bear way more badass than a grizzly bear. True. Yeah. So essentially, we'd be breeding super people in Chicago. Huge bear fans. Chicago should be really happy. That could just live off seal blubber and nothing else. (laughs) It'll make it much harder for the Matrix to take them down. (laughs) Stop bears. Number two, do you think that the message that Profound obesity in polar bears is benign. Is something manufactured by plus-sized female polar bear clothing retailers? And are they doing the bears a disservice health-wise by putting that message out there? You know, finally, the little fat polar girls have someone sticking up for them. Yeah. Okay? They have their own genre. Lay, the lame hey, I was, of, <laughs> was going to give them their own building where they could use their paws to do little polar bear hand jobs for... <laughs> What if they were? Uh, what if all the other species who were like with little fat girls, you know, little fat girl deer, little fat yeah. girl puppy, and everything? Don't oh, they all wish so that? Cute. Don't they wish <laughs> that they were polar bears? Where it's like not even an issue. We're being fifty percent. Like oh, there's totally. no such thing as a fat. A fat female polar bear is oh, more yeah. sexually desirable. It's like women nowadays who are plus size are always like, oh, I wish I was in the forties where it was like sexy to be this size. And you're like, Still well, actually, sexy as fuck to me. <laughs> By the way, yeah, in yeah. fact, if there's any large ladies that are on our fan base, go ahead and send me some pics. <laughs> Bobby likes. I uh, dress as a polar bear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, under 150 pounds need not apply. <laughs> and I'm assuming you're like four two at that. BBWs point. definitely apply. By the way, uh, Pizzly Bear or Pizzly. Pizzly. <laughs> Pizzly. Uh, Pizzly sounds like uh, like a really childish word that Mama Grizzlies tell their younger baby Grizzlies to refer to their penises by. <laughs> That's your pizzly. Don't touch it. Oh, no. God won't like that. Well, thanks for not stepping on my next totally. question, Damien. Question number three. If you don't know what it actually meant, what would you assume a pizzly was? Ooh, ooh. I have an idea. A penis for a little grizzly. Technically, Damien, right. you answered before the buzzer, so you're going right. to lose this So round. that's Jackie's answer. Damien, what do you have to say about what you think a pizzly would be? I think it's a very famous bear rapper. 
He's crossing genre. He's big in both the polar bear and Ooh, grizzly bear community. Okay. He's selling out. He's like Eminem. He's selling out stadiums all over Alaska. I think it would be great if a rapper of mixed white and black ancestry called themselves Pisley. Totally. Actually, when you were talking about it earlier during our brief, I thought maybe it was like a little zit that you get on your nipple. Okay. I could see that. I was going for uh, taking a piss in a spiral pattern. Like, Did you see me take a Pisley out there in the snow? (laughs) Like a swizzle. (laughs) You loved your spirograph as a kid. That's right. And our last article of the day... So this was an interesting study that came out in Science, and it shows that neurogenesis, or the creation of new neurons, can actually erase old memories. And most animals stop neurogenesis, stop producing new neurons pretty much right after they're born. Mm -hmm. Humans are different. Mice are also different. A couple other animals keep producing them um, after they're born, though they have a rapid production when they're young, and then it slowly tapers off as they age. So you you have a bunch of neurogenesis as a young, young child, and then it goes slower and slower as you grow up. What they found was that when mice create these new neurons, it basically erases memories of old stuff going on. The way they did it is the way they usually do. They shock the fuck out of some mice, just like Jackie likes. Uh, So they put the mice in this new enclosure. They did this test separately with adult mice and young mice. And they gave them a shock to see if they would remember where they got shocked and where to go and everything. The old mice remember... In like a maze, you mean? Yes. Okay. It, well, it was an enclosure. I don't know if it was necessarily a maze, but I think it was an enclosure with different parts of but it. Theoretically, they have to make a choice of which direction to go, which has a shock or, where or to not be. shock. Yeah. Okay. Um, the older mice remembered the, the new enclosure specifications for 30 days, meaning they would know where they would get shocked and everything else. New mice, young, basically, baby mice... Young, nubile... Young, firm, mice. supple mice. <laughs> they only remembered for a day. And Idiots! Idiots! So the idea was they keep uh, flooding in with these new neurons. It erases their old memories. When they did a treatment to slow down neurogenesis by 50% those, in those young mice, they would then remember for up to a week instead of just a day. They mm. would retain the memories of it. So while the, other, while the other all the other mice in the group thought that these guys were just stupid, <laughs> yeah, they actually were the ones getting shot less. That's exactly Irony. right. <laughs> how, how do they slow it down? It was like my, mouse memento. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's incredibly hard to tattoo a mouse. I actually tattoo the, mice on the rig. Picture yourself in this. You're, Do you you're, ever give one like a teardrop, like right no. under their eye? It's always a boring number. You're in elementary school. It's like it's like getting your ass kicked in college football by Forrest Gump. There's a guy who has half the mental capacity as you. Essentially, somebody injected him with a chemical that stopped his brain from producing neurons real quick as a child. Yeah. And now this kid's all American, and you're not. <laughs> what they also did was they increased neuron proliferation within the old mice and found out that that would decrease the amount of memory they have. They wouldn't remember the mouse as much. I, I want to know how they slow and speed up neurogenesis. That was good. So here, here is one of the questions I have for you guys. How do you think they speed up neurogenesis? How do they make it so that your brain produces more neurons? There are two things that they do that will help your brain produce more neurons on its own. What do you think they are? Electrical impulses. Just a shock. Do they, someone just tasers your brain? Yeah. Well, it's, okay. like a, it's more like a self-defense course. You know, like a female mouse just okay. gives him a taser. Gotcha. I'm thinking something with light. Interesting. No. Two things are exercise and Prozac. <laughs> Very interesting. Those two things apparently Prozac. stimulate neurogenesis, which that's kind of interesting. One of the theories is that might even be, and this is kind of far out theory. They don't know for sure, but they think that might even be one of the reasons that certain antidepressants work. If it stimulates Mm -hmm. uh, neurogenesis, then you create more neurons and, ironically, less memories. And so you might be taking away some of those things you're not very happy about in doing so. It's kind of interesting when you create more neurons, you create the ability to have more memories. It's like you're adding uh, memory to your hard drive. But when you add that memory, it's like you have to do part of a partial you have system to clean wipe. Up. Yeah, so you put a new hard drive in. Holy shit! Now I, I can store a terabyte on here. But I lost the last ten gigs that I saved to my oh, internal it's hard like, drive. It's like when you can't decide if you want to update the new iTunes. You're like, oh god, well I don't want to lose any of my songs. But yeah. you know, Apple. So uh, how are they slowing these mice down? They get some big tough rats to come in and just beat them savagely. <laughs> a lot of a lot of TBI. Yeah, they don't. They don't mention in in the article how they take take it down a notch. They just mentioned. They don't. No. That's what I want to know the most. The now, without it. implicating several of the scientists. No. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm wondering. 
Yeah, it'd be funny if they're like, the, raise, the way we keep animals from creating neurons in their brain is we just give them Snickers. If you eat Snickers, your brain will never create any more neurons. Like but you're not you when you're hungry. That's right. <laughs> M&M's Mars Corporation was very hesitant to release this research. <laughs> Don't tell them how they slowed it down. <laughs> so, question number one. This one goes mainly to Jackie. Mm -hmm. Why do researchers get off on torturing mice to prove everything? Oh, sure. That's easy to say. Civilian. Uh-huh. I'll have you saying... know that the FDA mandates that I torture mice. Okay. In order to... Maybe a little advance bit. Advance to torturing advance beagles. Advance to torturing... Not Maybe just little... beagles. Mostly beagles. But then monkeys. And then eventually humans. If more humans signed up for research without any knowledge of what's going on or the, the repercussions... We wouldn't torture mice. And did How's you ever that? think that maybe more humans would, stand, would sign up for research if they thought they were going to get a hand job from the hottest chick in their high school? I'm sure that's a study out there. And that You don't need the study. That these are, this is pretty well documented. <laughs> Men will go to great lengths for a hand job. I'm, I'm still shocked that she didn't like my idea because I feel like I'm going to a, a tribe that's out in the middle of some place trying to survive. And I'm like, this is agriculture. You'll be able to stay settled and provide more food for your family than you could ever imagine. And you'll never have to run around again. And they're like, eh, fuck it. Yeah, see, that, that's I'm what, bringing you agriculture, that's, Jackie. That's what I don't like about the idea. I don't think it's the worst idea, but I definitely don't think it's the best idea, which you do. You would have so many more sexy male reasons. You'd have, you'd have like, you might have illicit affairs. <laughs> illicit huge, affairs? With huge, Finally! With huge buff scientists. I, I just can't picture it. What do you mean, huge buff scientists? What I'm saying is that like now, the huge buff rats. If, if now the if now the quarterback of the football team, you know, now that he's forced to get good grades, he's learned I'm not going to the NFL. I, you know what I'm pretty good at? Bio class. Why not follow that? Why not follow that passion? Especially if it's a road filled with hand jobs. I mean, if if this if you find a way to follow this up through college and you just have a continual track of vaseline and a quickly moving forearm we could have science explode like those males certainly will at the end of the session you guys are missing the point we don't need more men in science we need more women need i more, believe we, we discussed need, that we women have Americans. better research results last week we need more americans in science it doesn't matter who they are yeah. well the hand job seems pretty one-sided okay so like <laughs> i said maybe we'll have another library that's filled with flowers i don't fucking know what you guys like but we'll do something for you i thought Plus you loved and respected us i love and respect Plus women you, ladies and are kicking ass. you don't need the bumper pool lane we clearly do like we clearly need the bumper pool lane be satisfied that that you guys won just Without incentives, you guys go to colleges and graduate and no, get advanced that, degrees at a higher rate. That should be your incentive to challenge us. We're not as competitive as you, okay? We need incentives to move forward. No, question the number two. Sex. Question number two. This neurogenesis thing validates the old saying about not wanting to learn something new and push old knowledge out of your head. What other seemingly stupid sayings will science find out to be true later? When in doubt, whip it out. I think that one actually works, but Okay. <laughs> All right, well, this scientific rule is going to go back to kind of what we were talking about before, is that only the most cruel scientists are the ones that work on people. Because only the most cruel mouse workers move up to beagles. And only the most cruel beagle workers move up to monkeys. Uh, next question. Is, th is, this, is neurogenesis issues really why we don't remember being a baby? Couldn't it just be that being a baby is so fucking boring that there's nothing much to remember about it? Yeah, most likely. Like, like, what are you going to remember? Like, how many times you shit a day? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, tits, maybe. And what if your mom had a yeah, great rack when you were young? Tits. You, you don't know at this point. Yeah, that's not a big issue. Even for babies you. get erections, and that's yeah. why. Ba what? Did you, you not know that? Even babies, babies get, erections. get erections. Yeah, babies get erections, and yeah. it's usually it's in its and it, there's yet to be a study, but it has to go. <laughs> it is sorry. correlated with moms who have great racks. You're saying babies get erections in response to their mother's boobs. Yeah, they're thinking about it in the bath time. It's not like randomly, like like things are turning on, things are developing. Yeah, it's probably more random. But here's the thing. A mom with a great rack, that's only going to help things out. I see. Yeah, you'll, you'll be in the bathtub, you know, and, you know, since you only have like 24 hours to remember this. <laughs> Uh, you know, like if mom fed you right before the I can't believe you don't know bath. this. You might be a mother someday. You should learn all this stuff. It, it, when that happens, you have to administer a medical-based hand job. Try and uh -huh. alleviate the baby's symptoms. It's painful to have yeah. a little baby erection. Really painful for baby erections. I, I like whose painful baby I erection use? was my first album, by the way. If you guys want to look up some of my earlier work, <laughs> your smooth jazz career didn't take off for whatever reason. <laughs> no, it did not. Okay, on to the next question. If Prozac helps neurogenesis, would giving Prozac to young children increase the future availability for memory while decreasing their present ability for it? If that was the case, 
Would you go so far as giving your kid Prozac at a young age to increase their ability to remember things when they're older? How shitty is their childhood? Yeah. Like, if I'm oh, a really shitty parent, yeah. no. Yeah. No, 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 even better. If you're a really shitty parent, you give it to them, it erases the current memories they have and yes. gives them a bigger hard drive to store more stuff later. Yes. So, all right, so I would use it to cover up past mistakes. Yeah. Right. You'd be father of the year. Yeah, but if I, was year. A, if I was a great parent, I wouldn't want to, I'd remember, like, hey, winter's coming, I'm going to be old one day. I don't want him to forget that I went to every fucking baseball game. Oh, yeah, there's that. Well, the thing is, when you start being a good parent, if you're just a shitty parent from zero to eight and you start cramming your kid full of Prozac to increase his memory by the time he gets off to college, you don't really need to start parenting in a good manner till he's like 14 or 15, which is what he'll remember that really well. A lot of time. Yeah. You just basically need to keep him from going off the rails. Yeah. Just keep, keep him standing. It doesn't need to be great. <laughs> just keep him standing. You can remold him. I feel like I would. I feel like if I knew that my kid could would become a much... You don't want to say smarter, but somebody who'd have a much yeah, better like, recall later in life and somebody who'd have a much greater uh, capability for memory. Eh, fuck your childhood memories. You don't need those that but much. But is it necessarily faster recall or just longer recall? More neurons, so the literally more storage space. Yeah, but like if we go back to the mouse situation, are they avoiding the shock faster or are they just, no, it just means remembering you, longer? Yeah, it'll, it would be... Well, the the remembering longer thing is actually about erasing old memories with uh-huh. neurogenesis. That's a little bit different. This is talking about building more and more neurons, yeah. which would mean that as an adult, you would have more neurons by which to store memories and therefore more ability to remember How do we things. know that these neurons are specific to memory parts of the brain? This is the, It's basically how we store memory uh, using the hippocampus and then the neurons and the cerebral cortex, and you withdraw memory and then put it back in. So they... So it's not overall increase in neurons in all parts of the brain. You're talking about specific areas of the brain that increase. Certainly those specific areas. I don't know if it's an overall increase as well. Because at what point do you make so many more neurons, you're Damien's kid, you become like a supervillain and can take him over Mm -hmm. and... you know, I could be used for evil. Is that what you're saying? As opposed to the force for good that I am now? No, he would like take you out first and then like... You know, because you fucked him up so much, the rest of the world would have to pay. It's very, like, Green Lantern-ish, you know? <laughs> What's that, the villain in Green Lantern? Uh, Sinestro? In the movie? In the shitty movie? In the shitty movie, yeah. I, I'm not even going to dig. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, if you ask me, considering Ryan Reynolds played the Green Lantern, the only enemy in that whole movie is his shirt, because that should have been off from the beginning. Girl, you know! <laughs> the only enemy is Ryan Reynolds' manager, who signed him <laughs> on to that. <laughs> All right, last question for this one. Guys, what memories would you like to erase using neurogenesis? Every Wednesday between 6 and 7.30. <laughs> That's when we <laughs> tape Science Faction, for those of you who are curious. <laughs> Damien, what memories would you like to erase using neurogenesis? From 1983 to 2000 and what year is it? 14. 2014. Okay. Oh, okay. I've had this procedure done a couple times, so uh-huh. okay. <laughs> I keep having to reset, I, you know. Let's just face it. I look at the total picture here, and I'm saying, whatever this is, it's not working. we got to do a whole reset. We can't. <laughs> you just want to forget your whole life. There's termite damage yeah. in the house. You best just, just tear it down and start a little. You're Let's doing a, Yeah, you're doing one of those system reboots on your phone that just <laughs> it wipes everything out. Restore iPhone. Every time it's turned out the exact same way. I'm starting to think yeah. I'm just destined to be a piece of shit. I don't, I don't understand. It's so weird you say that, because I think you're destined to be a piece of shit. You're like the well, so awesome. You're like the opposite of Groundhog Day. You wake up every day with no memory of the previous world around you, but everybody else remembers. <laughs> Means that I could treat everybody like crap, and it does. I don't. Why yeah. is everybody such an asshole to me? Get your the memory fuck out of my way. Your memory never really stopped you from doing that anyway. All right, and those are science articles. I think it might be time to move on. I don't know what topic we might do next, unless it's a lightning round. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Stop it. I've got <laughs> lightning effects. I, I went out and found them and I edited I them They're for a reason. <laughs> okay. The rules for lightning round. If you're not familiar, I will give my panelists a uh, one to two second, uh, one to two sentence question. They will give me their best response in one to two sentences themselves. Are you guys ready? Let's, let's do this. Uh, num- question number one. A new order of marine creature was discovered that can be up to six and a half feet long. While recently discovered to be a whole new order of animal, what were these originally thought to be? A dork, which I learned in fifth grade is a whale penis. You think there's an animal that y- they used to think was just a whale penis? I think that they were 
shed whale penises. Okay. You know, that's what they used to think. But now... And now it's a whole new order of animal? A whole new order of animal. Okay. He, I mean, it's huge. I think they're very self-conscious male research scientists when they saw how big the whale penis was. They're yeah. like, that just must be a parasitic creature. That There's no way that's a real... No creature's penis is that big. Right, yeah. Uh, Damien, what new order of animals are we finding in the sea? I think the uh, plastic, all the plastic that uh, uh-huh. has developed sentient life. And they've, uh, you know, so a bunch of these bottles have come together and are forming these. <laughs> oh, so in that big garbage patch in the North Pacific, a bunch of the plastic has come together, formed a sentient form of life, and, it, and is now operating in the environment under a new order. Yes. Plasticus Maximus. Yeah. <laughs> Close. Uh, in fact, it was part of what, what we thought was the sea anemone family. Sea anemone. Oh. Which feels a lot like a flaccid penis. That's true. So I'm very, very, very true. All right, lightning round question number two. What is the substantia nigra, and what did scientists recently find out about it? They found out that she is the host of the WB's new Wednesday Night Smash. <laughs> Ooh, substantia! <laughs> Come see Niagara Substantia. It's the other way around. It's substantia nigra. No, see... There was a comma. I didn't say the comma, okay. but I was reading it. That's my mistake. You were calling roll in her geometry class. Damien's closed, but what it actually is, is back in the days of slavery, prominent African Americans like Friedrich Douglass were substantial Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, God. they were to a substantial Nigra. Did you look at Django Unchained as a really sad movie? Like wow. at the end? Those, uh, those landowners were just killed. I'm a huge Leo fan. <laughs> Those landowners were killed in their own house. <laughs> That's a huge Leo fan. As funny and racist as that was, substantia nigra is actually part of your brain. Yeah. That, when electrically stimulated, can affect your ability to learn. All right. And last science article in the lightning round for this week. Scientists recently found the fossil remains of a 17-million-year-old shrimp. Why were these fossils particularly interesting or special? How old, how old were they again? Uh, 17 million. It was so interesting because they were found in a serving tray of a 17 million year old red lobster. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ironically, the person who was eating them was Substantia Nigra. <laughs> she loves buffets. Okay. The actual reason is because these are 17 million year old fossils of sperm. What? Yeah, this is a shrimp, a 17 million year old shrimp that had found sperm fossils. This is what else is really interesting. The sperm was the length, if not longer, than the organism that produced it. So it produced Whoa. a sperm that was wound up inside its gonads in such a manner so that oh. once it ejected it, it was actually longer than the animal itself. Oh my God. Yes, yeah, so it was very, very interesting. Can you imagine? It's a form of shrimp that lived 17 million years ago. The curled up sperm inside of it was as long as the body itself. It was preserved so well because it was in a pond that constantly had bat poo in it. Like, like guano? Yeah. So <laughs> bats would poo in it nonstop, and the phosphorus in there helped mineralize and make these fossils much huh. better. So they were essentially saved by the fact that they have a bunch of bat poo in there. And thanks, basically thanks to a bunch of bat poo, we get to witness the remains of like ancient shrimp bukkake. Can you imagine how awkward it was in little shrimp's teenage years just knowing that they couldn't get away with masturbating because they'd lose like 10% of their body weight? That's right. (laughs) Yeah. This is where the term batshit crazy comes from. (laughs) Oh! Apparently that means that anyone who is batshit crazy has spermed the length of their body. Well, that shit's crazy, is it not? That would be crazy. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great way to lose some weight before the wrestling match. (laughs) Just Just, jerk off this giant load. You're saying that if you go in the bathroom of any uh, high school gym restroom before a wrestling match, you just see a bunch of dudes beaten off? In the shrimp bathroom, yeah, for sure. Every ounce counts in, in human wrestling, too, so. <laughs> Great lightning round. Uh, I'm going to have to award that one to Jackie because of her racism and love for whales' penises. All right, and let's move right on to the things we thought we knew. <laughs> The things we thought we knew, because sometimes old science, like old people, is worthless and wrong. All right, and this week in Things We Thought We Knew, we're going to talk about resveratrol. Finally. Which uh, is found in chocolate and wine, and that is the reason people always say you should have dark chocolate or you should have a glass of wine. wine. It's supposed to be good for your heart. That kind of thing. So let's talk about resveratrol and what we've discovered recently. We've always been talking about how good it is for you based on mouse studies and yeast studies and other lab animals. Uh, So we operated under the assumption that increased resveratrol in humans meant that it would be good for us too. 
what it looks like is that an association looking at people's resveratrol levels and then coordinating it with their health seems to show no link whatsoever between resveratrol metabolites in urine and inflammation, cardiovascular disease, cancer, or longevity. Basically, all of the claims that were made about it do not seem to be backed up by the actual human research studies. Obviously, more studies will be needed. There could be other outstanding factors. There could be a lot of stuff. But as of now, there doesn't seem to be a reason to seek out resveratrol in the same way we have told people to in the past. Well, what's important to note about the study, which I read this morning, as a matter of fact, is that the dose of resveratrol that was given was a low dose, or that was noted was a low dose. So these are people who are just having casual amounts of wine and dark chocolate. If you go fucking gangbusters on wine, like I do every weekend, I'm <laughs> fucking set. That's that's the take home message there. You have you have to read between the lines a little bit. Well, they, low doses. They were actually that are looking. Not they were actually you, looking. Anything at, to justify your Johnny Depp marathon? <laughs> that's a lot. Was a great movie. This particular study was actually just looking at the metabolites people had. They weren't actually administering resveratrol. They were looking at the metabolites people had and associating it with health. So that would include people with a lot of resveratrol, and that also did not seem to be associated in any way with health. So I, don't know. I just think it's the thing alcoholics say because <laughs> they want to keep drinking wine. I'm like Who doesn't want to keep drinking wine? I'm like yeah. an alcoholic, but for alcohol. You know? yeah. What other drugs would people justify using in a certain manner because of, of a health effect that they have made up? Uh, let's see. Caffeine makes you less racist. Give me my coffee. Beaner. <laughs> Meth helps me attack the day. Yeah. Which actually it does, but you literally <laughs> attack people during the day. Cocaine helps me party. Oh, that's valid. <laughs> And I think that will be the theme for our new show. Let's move on to our final segment, Finish My Story. Finish My Story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, welcome back to Finish My Story, where our biomedical researcher, Jackie, will give Damien and myself the beginning to one scientific story, and we will have to answer it to her satisfaction. What is our running tally right now? I believe it's 3-2. Yeah, you're up one. 3-2. That changes today. Yeah, okay. let's see. Let's well, see literally it will. Let's see if tie it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm really glad that we were talking about giant sperm in the previous segment because um, I think it'll help really paint the picture for my question for you guys. Yeah, plus it got me all hot. Why should sperm not wear makeup? Because slutty sperm are not treated with respect. Ooh. In fact, That's true. In fact, if you gussy up a sperm and you let it walk around town all on its own, no egg is never going to accept that yeah. sperm once it sees that it, it'll just go around with anybody. Yeah. Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? It looks like a harlot. Or like the a semen fucking harlot. I'm going to agree with you, but I'm also going to disagree with you. Uh -huh. Okay. Because I think you have to. We've, we've created a sperm egg culture where these sperm have to. They have to dress up and be the prettiest. Only one of them gets accepted, and the rest That's of them true. die. Body image is a big deal in the sperm community. That's why every, that every man who's sexist remembers about the one time that he was objectified and had to sell out all of his brothers That's right. by wearing the shortest skirt. Oh, and Damien. the most makeup. Oh, Damien. In order to get accepted. No, I, I watch Brothers Die just so that one picky X chromosome <laughs> could be happy and have the prettiest one. The one that gave out. her the biggest wide on. Let it out. <laughs> That's why I'm so sexist. You know, I'll tell you okay. what. Uh, I think one of the problems with sperm wearing makeup is that you're just going to get more and more of these cases of sperm getting gussied up and then sexually assaulted by tadpoles. Oh, like they're asking for it. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a gussied up sperm looks pretty damn good to a tadpole. All right. Well, on that note, on unfortunately, the sperm tadpole neither of you are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the sperm devil. Neither of you are quite close. The answer is because of endocrine disruptors. Oh, that endocrine was my second answer. disruptors. Yeah. I had another answer where basically uh, Revlon's sperm line <laughs> of makeup. Oh, was so not fun. even sperm wearing makeup, but you wearing makeup of sperm. No, no, no. Revlon actually has a specific line of makeup meant for sperm. Oh, marketed to sperm. Marketed towards sperm. Just, <laughs> okay. uh, just you know, hey, you want you want to be the one selected? You want to be the sexiest sperm? Maybe he's born with it. <laughs> not until you get there. It's Maybelline. <laughs> <laughs> This is a study published in EMBO from, uh, it's a collaboration between Denmark and Germany. Uh, chemicals known as endocrine disruptors are found in common products like makeup, toothpaste, sunscreen, and some foods. And endocrine disruptors interfere with the body's ability to regulate hormone release. In men, this can lead to um, sperm's in inability to move, navigate, or penetrate the egg. So in this study, they looked at 96 chemicals um, tested on human sperm, chemicals solo and in combination, and a third of them had a negative effect. 
some of these chemicals you may have heard of in in the media lately, like uh, um, BPAs mm. or um, BPAs usually come PFCs. from heating plastics. Up right. And- yeah. Exactly. Um, the mechanism of action was uh, increased calcium flux in the sperm. So calcium ions regulate all the essential processes in a cell. Mm-hmm. So if there's a disruption in the balance of calcium, it could either shut down or over agitate a cell to a certain degree. So although BPA, which is sort of the one that everybody kind of thinks of as the bad chemical in plastic, mm-hmm. um, did not affect calcium, it did have a negative effect on sperm motility. They just don't know exactly how it happened. Also, some chemicals reduce sperm's ability to sense progesterone and prostaglandin. So not only can they not move around, but they, they don't even know what the fuck they're It can't doing. tell when there's a weakness in the force. Yeah, so they don't know where to look for the egg. So that is why sperm should not wear makeup. Sperm but, should definitely not wear makeup. Right. But I, I the think the loser in, of this will have to wear makeup. I brought my <laughs> make, I brought my Maybelline bag. Let's I'm do glad this. you did because I'm gonna have to give this one to Bobby. <laughs> All right, start applying. <laughs> Your sperm might not look pretty, but by the end of the night, you will. <laughs> Thanks for playing, boys. All right, and with that, we're gonna finish up, finish my story and science faction in general. Thanks for coming out for episode 19. Hope to see you on episode 20. I look better in Earth tones. Just be mild. <laughs> You've been listening to Science Fuction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>